afternoon. I'm Victoria Marshall with the latest news from the Washington Watch News Desk. The Supreme Court ruled on Monday that former President Donald Trump has immunity from prosecution for official acts taken while president. In a 6-3 opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that, under our constitutional structure of separated powers, the nature of presidential power entitles a former president to absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions within his conclusive and preclusive constitutional authority. And he is entitled to at least presumptive immunity from prosecution for all his official acts. There is no immunity for unofficial acts. The decision is a blow to special counsel Jack Smith's case against the former president for alleged election interference on January 6. Roberts wrote that Trump is entitled to presumptive immunity for official acts, but no immunity for unofficial acts, meaning the judge overseeing Trump's January 6 case will have to determine whether the acts Trump is accused of are official or not. The decision all but guarantees that Trump's January 6 case will not be tried until after the election. And also today, the Supreme Court refused to rule on a challenge to two laws in Florida and Texas that prevent social media companies from censoring users. The justices unanimously agreed to return the cases to lower courts for more analysis. Justice Elena Kagan, writing for the majority, wrote that lower appeals courts hadn't properly analyzed the First Amendment challenges to the Florida and Texas laws. Florida's law prevents social media platforms from permanently banning politicians, while Texas's prohibits the companies from removing any content based on a user's views. The laws came about after some social media companies banned former President Trump from their platforms after the January 6 protest at the U.S. Capitol. The Biden administration has sided with the social media companies in both challenges to the laws. And in other Capitol Hill news, President Joe Biden and close allies continue to conduct damage control after the president's poor debate performance last week. While Democratic donors and other prominent media allies have called on the president to step aside, President Biden has doubled down on staying in the race, according to media reports. Per The New York Times, Biden's family, most notably First Lady Jill Biden and son Hunter, are urging the president to stay in the race. As such, a massive PR campaign is underway to rehabilitate Biden's image and to reject calls for him to drop out of the race. There are uh, uh, health care professionals who think that, that uh, Trump has dementia, that his connection, uh, his thoughts do not go together. And, uh, you know, while, uh, while he may be saying we're enablers, we see Joe Biden up close. We know how uh, attuned he is to the issues, how informed he is. And I debate with him about uh, legislation and the, not debate, but discuss it with him. He's right there. So in any case, it was a bad night. Let's not sugarcoat that. It was a bad night. It was a great presidency. Pelosi's comments come after a CBS News YouGov poll found that three-quarters of registered voters do not believe Biden is mentally fit to be president and that he should not be running for re-election. And finally, Oklahoma will now be teaching about the Bible in its public schools. We've been looking at Oklahoma academic standards, and it's crystal clear to us that in the Oklahoma academic standards, under Title 70, multiple occasions, the Bible is a necessary historical document to teach our kids about the history of this country, to have a complete understanding of Western civilization, to have an understanding of the basis of our legal system. According to Oklahoma State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Ryan Walters, every classroom in the state from grades 5 through 12 must have a Bible, and all teachers must, te must teach about the Bible in the classroom. Walters said this move is critical to ensure students grasp the core values and historical context of the country. This order comes after Louisiana passed a law last month that requires the Ten Commandments be displayed in all public school classrooms. And those are today's headlines. I'm Victoria Marshall. For more news and commentary, check out The Washington Stand at WashingtonStand.com. Up next is Washington Watch. We'll see you tomorrow with more news.
From the heart of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., bringing compelling interviews, insightful analysis, taking you beyond the headlines and sound bites into conversations with our nation's leaders and newsmakers, all from a biblical worldview. Sitting in for Tony is today's host, Jody Heiss. Well, good afternoon. Hope you had a fantastic weekend and welcome to this Monday edition of Washington Watch. I am Jody Heiss sitting in today for Tony and so glad that you have joined us. All right, coming up this evening on Washington Watch. First of all, the Supreme Court ruled today that a former president has substantial immunity from prosecution for official acts committed while in office. As you would expect, that's a decision that has the left absolutely crying wolf. The Supreme Court is functioning and it is basically giving a green light for criminal activity in the Oval Office under certain circumstances, which I think given the present state of our country is very, very scary. Well, that was CNN political commentator Van Jones today. I'll be joined here in just a few moments by Congressman Eric Burleson for his take on the 6-3 to three Supreme Court decision. And the U.S. military bases in Europe were reportedly put on a state of heightened alert over the weekend. This comes amid repeated warnings from intelligence officials that the U.S. is at the highest possible level of threat right now. The world is a more complicated place than it was 10 year, years ago, in particular with the war in Israel and Gaza. We see every uh, radical Islamic group from the Houthis to all the Iranian back proxies interested in doing things that they might not have wanted to do 10 years ago. Well, that was Democratic Congressman Jim Hines. He's the ranking member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Yesterday, he was on Face the Nation with CBS. Well, could the U.S. weakness on the world stage be encouraging America's enemies? We'll discuss this a little bit later on with U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis. And the left isn't happy about the latest move by a state to bring the Bible back into classrooms, even though, as we all know, the Bible has been the cornerstone of Western civilization. The Bible is a necessary historical document to teach our kids about the history of this country, to have a complete understanding of Western civilization, to have an understanding of the basis of our legal system, and is frankly, we're talking about the Bible, one of the most foundational documents used for the Constitution and the birth of our country. Well, that was Oklahoma's top education official, Ryan Walters, who was speaking last Thursday before directing schools in his state to teach students about the Bible. Well, Superintendent Walters will be joining me a little bit later in the program. Lastly, the fallout continues over President Biden's disastrous debate last week with former President Trump. But obviously, there was a, a big problem with uh, Joe Biden's debate performance. And there's also uh, just a tremendous reservoir of affection and love for Joe Biden in our party. And so this makes it uh, a difficult situation for everybody, but there are very honest and serious and rigorous conversations taking place at every level of our party. Wow, that was Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin yesterday on MSNBC's Velshi. So what might the Democrats do about all of this? And what are they allowed to do, given where we are already in the process? Well, Philip Klein, the former attorney general for Kansas and former district attorney for uh, Johnson County there in Kansas, he'll be joining me for that discussion a little bit later in the program. So we've got a packed, packed program coming your way. You don't want to miss a bit of it. But if by any chance you do, you can always catch it at TonyPerkins.com. Keep that website available. Tons of resources there available for you. You always want to keep that handy. Again, TonyPerkins.com. All right, let's jump into our first item of discussion today. Earlier, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court released the remaining opinions that were uh, cases that were coming from 2023 and 2024. But obviously, drawing the most attention was the Supreme Court's ruling in Trump v. United States, where the court held that a former president has absolute immunity for his core constitutional powers. The decision was six to three, and it has the anti-Trump left absolutely throwing a tantrum. So what impact 
is this decision going to have? Joining me now to discuss this and more is Congressman Eric Burleson. He serves on three House committees, including the Great Oversight and Accountability Committee, as well as the Education and Workforce Committee. He represents the 7th Congressional District of Missouri. Congressman Burleson, always great to have you. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to be back. Well, listen, first of all, before we get into all this stuff, let me just say on a personal note, congratulations on being recognized last week with FRC Action's annual award for members of Congress who scored a perfect 100 percent for votes that were cast on our scorecard in 2023. We are very proud of you and thank you for your great stance. Well, thank you. It's it's an honor. Honestly, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have I would have uh, pinched myself for the opportunity to meet with you and and Tony Perkins and and uh, it's just I just keep having to pinch myself because I you know I've looked up to all you you guys as heroes and fighters for our values and um, I'm just uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. Well, that's very kind. To be honest, we're now pinching ourselves and honored to have you standing tall and standing firm for our values. So thank you so much. All right, let's uh, turn to the Supreme Court decision. If you can, give me your take on today's ruling, uh, specifically the one on former President Trump's immunity. Yeah, the left is going crazy. They're making accusations like that, uh, for example, what this would allow President Biden to send in SEAL Team 6 to, to, to assassinate the, his opponents. That is not at all the case. The court didn't rule in that way. The court, I felt like, made a very common sense ruling that the a president has immunity in, when, when, when performing the duties of his office. Um, it just so happens that some of those duties include making sure that there was no, that there's no voter fraud that occurred um, in the previous election. That was clearly within the duties of the president to make sure that there was nothing that was rigged. And... Um, and so he, you know, I think that he he kept within his role, and because of that, I think that the court rightly ruled that his uh, that it's not you know his his acts were not um, that they are that there's immunity for those acts. We'll see how this returns to the to the what the judge does with this with this ruling. Um, hopefully, the the hopefully the judge will dismiss the the case altogether. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how that uh, um, unfolds. But when you say the left is uh, just going crazy over this, you're right. I, in fact, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic House Minority Leader, he's already warned that the Supreme Court's decision today on immunity, he said it sets a dangerous precedent for the future of our nation. Uh, can you give me a response to that kind of reaction? Yeah, I think that they're using hyperbole. Obviously, as the, like for example, that reference about sending in the SEAL team, it, it's just absurd. I think that they're overreacting. Look, they've been they've been trying to do everything they can to stop Trump from being on the ballot again. I think that they know that he's popular. Um, he he's a very unique candidate, and so they're doing. They can't win um, in in the in the public opinion, the court of public opinion. So they're going to try to take him on in the courtroom and they have weaponized as you know the ju the judicial system and their court system and uh it's 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 great to see that the highest court of land supreme court stepped in and said that they this is a bridge too far that these um the this that prosecuting him for uh trying to perform the duties of his office is a bridge too far yeah it really is and i, I know there's a, a lot of us that have been waiting on a court finally to recognize what many have said, this is obvious, why is it taking so long? So yeah, we're excited about that and uh, it is good to get some common sense back in the courts. Uh, there was another uh, case from the, that the uh, Supreme Court ruled on today. It's kind of on hold, but the uh, Florida and Texas laws that were seeking to limit how social media platforms uh, regulate uh, user content I, it's going back to the lower courts, but do you have a reaction on that? I do not. I I haven't had a chance to look at that one. I know that Missouri, the the case, the the court case on Missouri, I was highly disappointed in that in the outcome of that. Um, 
I, I think that, uh, you know, social media, uh, they, I think that them working with the federal government was an absolute um, horrific thing for democracy. And, and I, I was disappointed with that court decision. I'll have to take a look at uh, the Florida decision as well. Yeah, we'll see. It's just on hold. It hasn't gone away. It's just a, a pause, if you will. I think it's certainly going to be coming back, but they want more, the lower courts to do more uh, more work on it. If we can switch gears, there's a, still a lot of talk about the presidential debate last week and the disastrous performance from Joe Biden. Uh, what, what are you hearing since then? What, what's your sense in Congress in terms of uh, what other members are thinking about Joe Biden's abilities? You know, the, the day after I was in the member gym, and um, uh, you, you know, as, as a former member, that that's kind of an area where you, you typically have Republicans and Democrats that, you, you know, it, we're not talking politics. We kind of, um, you know, it's a jovial environment. And yet that morning after the debate, Democrats were, they were aloof. They were kind of pulling um, to, to themselves that you could, they were, they weren't talking to the rest of us. Um, and so you could tell that they were, that they were taken aback by that performance. And I think that, uh, you know, what's clear is that the Democratic Party is trying to figure out what their next steps are going to be. I think, though, the problem is that the toothpaste is out of the, out of the, or the, the it's, at the, it's out of the tube. So they, there's no putting it back in. And the problem is that they're facing is that it's going to be very, very difficult to get Joe Biden off of the ballot. Um, th what I learned today is that, for example, the money that's in his account, you know, all of all of those, I, I think, uh, closing in on $100 million can only be used. It's not transferable. It can only be used on the Biden-Harris campaign. So I don't... Um, I don't know that this is a, that they that they have an option to be able to back out of this. Well, wow, that's a lot of money uh, that's pretty well restricted. You know, it looks like the same Democrats and yeah, you talk about how it was there in the gym, but the very same ones who are now wanting to replace Biden as a candidate seem to have no problem with him remaining as president. Uh, that in itself just seems like they're more concerned about the election than they are about questions that came to surface as to the president's fitness mentally. Um, any, yeah. any thoughts on that? Well, these are the most dangerous months potentially in the United States where we have someone that right. apparently is only cognitive um, or alert for a few hours in the day. Um, even that's, that's what his staff are now leaking to the press is that uh, there's two Bidens. There's the, the Biden that's alert from 10 a.m. until 2, and then there's uh, there's Sleepy Joe after that. that. That's not good for America and our security. I think that um, these, these are going to be the very dangerous months. But one thing to note is that, look, the media and his and his handlers have been hiding this and covering this up for months and months right. and months. And, uh, and, you know, they've been lying to us. And so you know, why do why do we uh, want to believe the things that they're trying to tell us today? When we Absolutely. know all this time. Well, we uh, just need to get a global memo out that all emergencies must happen between the hours of 10 and 4 Eastern time. Uh, unbelievable. Congressman Eric Burleson of Missouri's 7th District, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you. All right, friends, after the break, the U.S. military bases in Europe were put on a heightened state of alert over the weekend. We'll give you all the details on that after the break, so stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute. Download the new Stand Firm app for Apple and Android phones today and join a wonderful community of fellow believers. We've created a special place for you to access news from a biblical perspective, read and listen to daily devotionals, pray for current events, and more. Share the Stand Firm app with your friends, family, and church members, and stand firm everywhere you go. Hello, I'm Jody Heiss, president of FRC Action. Here in America, we thank God for the right to vote, and we can all agree on the importance of this upcoming election. Many of us want to support candidates who share our values, but we're not comfortable supporting the big national political organizations. 
Well, we have a solution for supporting candidates through FRC Action's Faith, Family, and Freedom Fund. Being a super PAC, it allows for unlimited individual and corporate donations. So we can endorse and fund campaigns for people who share our values. By giving to this fund, we're able to pull all of our contributions together and support and endorse like-minded candidates. That's how we move the needle. So let's be the best stewards possible and get the most out of our political contributions by uniting our efforts. For more information or to contribute, visit faithfamilyfreedomfund.org. Thank you so much and God bless you. All of us are born with the desire to find truth and meaning. Where did I come from? What happens when I die? While our answers to these questions may divide us, we are united in our need for the freedom to answer life's biggest questions and make life's biggest decisions for ourselves. That's why religious freedom matters for everyone. Religious freedom matters because the powerful have long wanted to control those who are less powerful. Religious freedom matters because the freedom of those who are different is often threatened by those who believe different is dangerous. At the Center for Religious Liberty at Family Research Council, we promote religious freedom for everyone because the only alternative is religious freedom for no one. We encourage Americans and the American government to engage and advocate for the persecuted, and they do. We work every day to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. We do it because that's what Jesus does. We work to give freedom to others because we ourselves have been set free. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Washington Watch. So honored to have you. I'm your host, Jody Heiss. Honored to be sitting in today for Tony. All right. Uh, you may have heard over the weekend, U.S. military bases in Europe were reportedly put on a state of heightened alert over the weekend, according to Stars and Stripes, which is the service of the DOD's defense media agency. Uh, their bases in Germany and Italy rose to the condition, rose their, the condition of their force protection threat to Charlie until further notice. Now, the military sets force protection levels at different categories, either normal, alpha, bravo, charlie, or delta. And delta, of course, being the highest state of alert. So can we expect more of this in the months ahead? Well, joining me now to discuss this is retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis. He's a senior fellow for national security here at FRC and the author of Kings of the East, China's plan to eliminate America and impose a communist world order. Lieutenant Colonel McGinnis, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you, sir. My pleasure, Jerry. Good day. Well, thank you so much, and likewise to you. All right, let, tell me, what happened over the weekend that rose the, the alert? Uh, is this a common occurrence, or is this something very serious that's taking place? Well, in the past, Jody, uh, we would only have a, a an increase of the force protection level by one level, say to a Charlie, uh, that would last a couple of days based upon uh, rather specific uh, threats of uh, terrorist activity or other types of activity in, near an installation. Now, I will tell you, I, I go in the Pentagon a lot. Uh, we've been at, at the Pentagon, at least at level Bravo for a long time, mostly since 9-11. You know, but the increase by the European Command, UCOM, over in Stuttgart, indicates that in several locations, not only in Germany, but also uh, it appears Romania, Bulgaria, that they have rather specific uh, indicators of some sort of terrorist potential activity. Now, it could be other than terrorism, there could be uh, an indication of what the Russians might be doing to interrupt our 
you know, activities in helping the Ukrainians. Uh, it could be something even broader than that. Certainly the Olympics come to mind that start later this month. So there are a host of issues that might be at play, but we're not going to get the specifics announced publicly uh, because we're going after the sources of that information and hopefully will delay or prevent uh, any attack against our personnel. Well, that makes perfect sense when you explain it that way. But you have to admit the timing of all of this is is very interesting, considering the really the global message of weakness and frailty that was sent out during the debate last week. And, you know, I, while I, I, there, there may be some assumptions taking place, and you, you mentioned several possibilities as to what prompted the rise to the Charlie level, uh, but how critical is it that the United States overall show strength on the world stage right now? Well, there's no question that we've, the perception amongst our allies is that we're weakened um, post uh, the debacle of Afghanistan. And of course, I arguably, you know, us standing down to a certain degree and allowing Putin to invade into Ukraine. Now, at the same time, of course, uh, this administration has been pumping you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of equipment to the Ukrainians and have rallied the NATO allies to do much the same. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we have the Chinese that are breathing down our neck. Uh, the Russians, of course, have you know, really energized their entire population vis-a-vis uh, -vis the re-election of Vladimir Putin. And of course, they've industrialized their military you know, capabilities to an extent that we haven't seen since the Cold War. So that plus the, the Gaza attack uh, that is ongoing, the, the debacle of October the 7th and what followed, uh, and of course, uh, re-energized North Korea, uh, re-energized Iran. All of this uh, paints a very dire situation across the world. And so I'm not surprised, at least right now, given all of that, uh, that we have uh, tension and, and as a result have increased our force protection, which means basically more guards at the post, uh, more listening to all sorts of chatter on the internet, uh, and of course, uh, more inspections of anything that might try to come into our installations, whether at Ramstein or Kaiserslautern or up in uh, Hohenfels or even down in Vicenza in Italy. So there are a host of things we're watching for, and it could be uh, very dangerous if something were to provoke what's going on right now. Well, you use the word dire. I think that's an appropriate word to use. You know, but the, the, the threat is not just overseas, I mean, even right here on our own U.S. soil. I'm sure you saw a recent report that revealed that ISIS-affiliated smugglers, a network of them of some 400 individuals, came through the southern border, all of it right here on the Biden administration's watch. Uh, but using the labels that the military has for states of alert, I would venture to say we here on our own homeland, we are no longer at normal anymore. Would you agree with that? No, oh, absolutely, Jody. You know, it, yeah, the fact so that where, So where would you think we are? I mean, are we, out, are, are we Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta? Where would you suspect we are right here on the homeland? Probably Charlie trending to Delta because... Uh, the southern border has been wide open for a long time. Millions of people have come in. And, you know, it doesn't take, as we saw on September the 11th, 20, or 2001, it only takes 19 bad dudes to, you know, disrupt the entire United States. So yeah. I suspect, given the many thousands of uh, military-age communist uh, Chinese, uh, many from the Middle East, many from Northern Africa, where we don't have any real friends. And then, of course, uh, uh, an odd lot from Eastern uh, Europe that we could very well have you know, many, many uh, bad characters that are in sleeper cells that are posted around this country near our critical infrastructure. And, of course, they could go into a local mall and shoot things up and cause now, all sorts of chaos. So we are at a very heightened level, I think, even though it's not acknowledged by the Homeland Security people. Uh, but the risk is high. And I know the FBI director, what, a couple of months ago said that he hasn't seen the, the lights of the red lights of uh, blinking as much as they have in recent years. So this is right. a dangerous time. 
Wow. Well, that makes all the more critical elections. They have consequences. Mm -hmm. It makes all the difference in the world. And that's why we need to pray. We need to vote. We need to stand. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, Senior Fellow for National Security here at FRC. Always great to have you. All right, coming up after the break, we know that teaching from the Bible is critical for spiritual formation, but it's a lot more than that. Oklahoma's top education official will tell us what they're doing. Stay tuned. Everything we do begins as an idea. Before there can be acts of courage, there must be the belief that some things are worth sacrificing for. Before there can be marriage, there is the idea that man should not be alone. Before there was freedom, there was the idea that individuals are created equal. It's true that all ideas have consequences, but we're less aware that all consequences are the fruit of ideas. Before there was murder, there was hate. Before there was a Holocaust, there was the belief by some people that other people are undesirable. Our beliefs determine our behavior, and our beliefs about life's biggest questions determine our worldview. Where did I come from? Who decides what is right and wrong? What happens when I die? Our answers to these questions explain why people see the world so differently. Debates about abortion are really disagreements about where life gets its value. Debates over sexuality and gender and marriage are really disagreements about whether the rules are made by us or for us. What we think of as political debates are often much more than that. They're disagreements about the purpose of our lives and the source of truth. As Christians, our goal must be to think biblically about everything. Our goal is to help you see beyond red and blue, left and right, to see the battle of ideas at the root of it all. Our goal is to equip Christians with a biblical worldview and help them advance and defend the faith in their families, communities, and the public square. Cultural renewal doesn't begin with campaigns and elections. It begins with individuals turning from lies to truth. But that won't happen if people can't recognize a lie and don't believe truth exists. We want to help you see the spiritual war behind the political war, the truth claims behind the press release, and the forest from the trees. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Jody Heiss, and an honor today to be sitting in for Tony. All right, the left is up in arms after Oklahoma's top education official on Thursday pushed out to all the state superintendents a memo requiring, catch this, requiring every Oklahoma school to incorporate the Bible as instructional support for students in grades 5 through 12. It's amazing. Well, clearly those on the left are also in need of a history lesson because it's, it's obvious that they don't understand the importance and value of having basic knowledge of the most important and most significant book in history, and one that certainly has been a cornerstone of Western civilization. Well, here to give a lesson about that and much more is Ryan Walters. He's Oklahoma's state superintendent of public instruction. Superintendent Walters, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you. Thank you for having me on. And I've been saying, look, the left can be offended, they can be upset, but they can't rewrite our history. We're very excited to be the first state in the country to put the Bible back in every classroom. Our kids are going to know the impact of the Bible in American history. That's amazing. And, you know, it's so basic. It's something that was in our classrooms for, it uh, seems like, forever until, uh, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago, we started seeing all that change. But it's not just the issue that students are better off having a basic knowledge of the Bible. That is true. But as you're alluding to even here, without it, there's a significant hole in their education. Isn't that basically part of the whole issue here? Yeah, you know, uh, I think it's academic malpractice not to have the Bible as a source document that's being used heavily in your schools. And I'm going to take you back just a few examples of that. How do you explain to students why Thomas Jefferson felt the need to say our rights are endowed by us by our creator? Well, where did that come from? Well, why did the Puritans, why did the pilgrims come to America in the first place? How do you explain these things without talking about the Bible? How do you explain to folks why Abraham Lincoln would cite 
tremendous amounts of scripture in every speech he gave. How do you explain why Martin Luther King Jr. continued to tie concepts from the Bible to every single aspect of the civil rights movement without talking about the Bible? But what we have seen is the left has been targeting the Bible and Christianity in schools to drive the Bible out. They don't want any mention of Christianity, any mention of the Bible. Well, that's not our history. So we're going to make sure that our kids understand why uh, the role the Bible played in the events in American history and the impact that those individuals said that the Bible had on them. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. And I mean, there's no question the Bible is by far the most quoted uh, book of, of of any uh, among our founders. And uh, look, I, everybody gets it. The Bible's a religious text, if you want to call it that. Okay. But the left also fails to see what you're saying uh, is that it's also historical in so many ways. And that's where, again, you know, they can be offended. They they don't have to, you know, adhere to the scripture in the Bible by, you know, that's that's their right, their freedom. But here's what they can't do. They can't tell our kids, now, you're going to learn about all the history, but if somebody mentioned the Bible or, or scripture from the Bible, we can't tell them about that. That, that part's going to be censored, so kids can't know that. So what you have when that happens, by the way, is you get kids that understand liberty to an extent. They understand the Constitution to an extent. But they're missing a large part of it, right? They're missing, why, why was it so important to delineate that our rights aren't given by government, they came from God? Why did the founders believe it was so important that you can read Franklin, Jefferson, Washington, all have all these quotations around, you know, you have individual liberty, but then you also have your faith, morality that are essential to help guide the individual behaviors of individuals who have this liberty. Well, if you don't talk about that, you're really not explaining why the founders said America was exceptional. You're really not explaining how they thought liberty was supposed to work in American society. And frankly, to your point, until the 1960s, if you walked into a schoolhouse, you were going to see the Bible. You were going to hear teaching from the Bible. You were going to hear a lot of literary references to the Bible as well. It's the number one best-selling book in American history. If that doesn't qualify for a piece of literature that should be in the classroom, I don't know what book would meet, would, would, would qualify. Yeah, I mean, this is so exciting to see what you're doing, and I hope there are other uh, state school superintendents who are watching this are going to be able to see your comments here, because this not only is a, a great move, but it is common sense. I, it is the foundation upon which our legal system in our country was comprised of. And it's interesting, too, that this is coming right on the heels as Louisiana made it law that the Ten Commandments need to go up in every classroom in the state. You know, and, and to, to go to your point with the morality issue, isn't it, I mean, isn't it just kids are better off to be reminded not to steal, not to murder, to honor their parents? I mean, all these things are part of it. It all wraps together to make perfect sense and to provide a much more edu uh, well-grounded education for our kids. First of all, these radical leftists that are attacking our move to put the Bible back in school are the same people that we've been fighting here in our state and across the country who want to put gender, queer, and flamer in every classroom. So they want to put pornography in there to push your kids to be transgender, but then they claim there's no academic value to the Bible. Think about the absurdity of that position. But yeah, you know what happens? You know, our society, our founders, so many folks in our history believed you had to talk about the faith and morality aspect of society in conjunction with a government protecting your God-given rights. So when you take one of those out of the equation and you will not not allow a mentioning of faith, of morality in school, well, you, you know, that's a, that's a society the framers were very concerned about. And so these are the type of lessons our kids should know, our kids should understand. And, and again, it is academic malpractice to do that. And you mentioned Louisiana. I just want to say this. President Trump has really laid the groundwork for this to happen. He came out and supported the Ten Commandments in Louisiana. He's come out and supported us as a state. He tweeted about us a couple of weeks ago and our efforts. So President Trump putting Supreme Court justices who actually read the Constitution, not what some left-wing professor said about the right. Constitution, gives us tremendous strength moving forward. For if this gets a challenge, we know that President Trump has got great justices on the court. Ryan Walters, thank you so much. Great job there in Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us on Washington Watch. All right, friends, after the break, we're going to today's Supreme Court ruling. Stay tuned. Join us October 3rd through the 6th as we gather with spiritually active, governance-engaged conservatives from across America at the Pray, Vote, Stand Summit in Washington, D.C. We'll pray for our nation, engage in government and culture, and stand for biblical truth 
alongside Christian leaders, worldview experts, and government officials. We'll discuss important issues like the sanctity of life, religious freedom, protecting students, strengthening families, praying for our nation, and how you can impact America's future from a biblical worldview. Our nation stands at a critical juncture, and we must ensure that the issues impacting faith, family, and freedom are understood and advanced. Register by July 8th and receive a $70 discount off admission. Register now at PrayVoteStand.org. That's PrayVoteStand.org. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in Him through His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in Him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Jody High, sitting in today for Tony. Look, before we dive into our next segment, there's a reminder that I want to bring your way that is extremely, extremely important. Uh, Tony has been sharing with you in recent days that the GOP Platform Committee is going to be meeting a week before the party's upcoming convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And a big question going into that platform discussion is on the issue of life. And particularly when you consider that we've seen so many in the party shrink back from speaking on the life issue, it's important that all of us get involved right now. And so uh, we want you to jump in with us and tell your state Republican Party chairs to protect life in the 2024 GOP platform. And you can do so simply by signing a petition that we're going to be delivering to urge them to stand up for life uh, and to stand up for those delegates who will be fighting to keep pro-life values in the 2024 Republican Party platform. So you've got a couple of options to sign this petition. You can go to frcaction.org slash life, or you can simply text the word life, L-I-F-E, to 67742. Either way, we'll get you the info so that you can sign the petition and have your voice heard to keep life in the Republican platform. All right, as I shared at the top of the program, this morning the U.S. Supreme Court released a bombshell decision in the case concerning presidential immunity, specifically as it relates to former President Trump. This is a huge issue. We've had people wanting to have this thing dissected and explain what it means, and I'm happy to say that here now to break all this down for us is Philip Klein. He's associate professor of law at Liberty University and is the former attorney general for the great state of Kansas and former district attorney for Johnson County. Philip, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you. Good to be with you, Congressman. 
All right, so let's get down to it in layman's terms. Let's start here, in layman's term. What did the court decide in the Trump immunity case? Well, they basically reinforced a longstanding notion of the separation of powers in the United States and basically stating that a president in the exercise of his constitutional and statutory responsibilities needs to be immune from zealous or, or overreaching oversight by the other branches of government, including that of Congress and even the courts, as well as a prosecutor who might take a law and try to weaponize it against the president to try to deter certain behavior. A president cannot make the decisions that he or she needs to make if there's what's called the pall of prosecution hanging over them. The president makes numerous decisions every day which dramatically impact individuals and others. And if he was subject to civil litigation or criminal prosecution for any decision that he makes, then he would be reticent to make the decisions he needs to make. So the court recognized that. And it's fascinating, Congressman, to look at the position of the Biden Justice Department in this case, because they essentially said, that the president's not immune from anything that could be considered a crime. And right now, if you look at how the Justice Department is interpreting laws, almost anything, when combined with all the laws that have been passed, could be a crime. And that the Justice Department said that we ought to consider the motive of the president in determining whether it's a crime. And that President Trump had the motive to stay in power. Well, let's take a look at Biden right now. Biden has repeatedly been told by federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court, that his loan forgiveness program is illegal. He doesn't have the authority to do it. Yet he persists in the face of court orders to try to do the student loan forgiveness program. And I believe part of his motive is reelection. So under the Justice Department interpretation, Biden could be prosecuted for his insistence on student loan forgiveness. It's insane today in America how this party is willing to interpret the law to target its enemies and to maintain its own authority. And this is exactly the type of thing that presidential immunity is designed to guard against. And that's basically oh, that's what the court said. That, that is an excellent example with the student loan thing. I have not connected those dots, and that just makes all the sense in the world. I think that will be extremely helpful to our viewers and, and listeners as well to, to just ha have a, a, an up-to-date what's happening right now is, uh, is, is right in line with this whole decision. So with the Supreme Court decision, did they differentiate between what counts as an official act versus a personal act? Well, they gave a little bit of guidance, and they say that it's very factual intensive. If it is an official act of the president, it is within his authority granted by law, then that affords him, in, in certain instances, absolute immunity under its constitutional authority, like President uh, Trump's communications with his own Justice Department, visit President Trump working with uh, Mr. Pence when he was vice president, all of that the court has determined he is granted right now absolute immunity. So all of that evidence can't even be used to support the other crimes based upon this court decision, because you can't predicate an indictment based upon conduct for which the president is immune. That calls into question, by the way, the initial indictment it is in its entirety, because Jack Smith introduced all that evidence to the grand jury to obtain an indictment. And as the court states in its 6-3 decision, you can't use conduct for which the president is immune to justify or to help support an indictment um, in its entirety. So there's some real questions there. But additionally, any president is allowed to have 
a presumption of immunity in certain of all official acts. And that presumption is a real high burden for the government to meet. It must show that the government's prosecution would have no impact on the president exercising his responsibilities. That is extraordinarily hard to prove, if not impossible to prove, especially in this context. Now, the court remanded the case to the lower court to determine whether the president was engaged in official or unofficial acts. There is no immunity for unofficial acts. So we have to look at what remains in the indictment and assess the facts surrounding that to determine if President Trump, in his communication with state legislators, with governors, with secretaries of state, expressing his concerns about the election, and in trying to get those states to reconsider their certification, were unofficial acts. So the issue then becomes whether it was of a legitimate public concern for the president to speak into election integrity. Well, Congressman, there have been hundreds of laws passed and amended since 2020 because of concerns about the 2020 election. It is undisputed that in 2020, numerous laws were broken that there was an unprecedented impact that still hasn't been measured of private monies going directly into election offices. There have been numerous court findings that much of the conduct of the 2020 election was against the law. For example, drop boxes were illegal in Wisconsin. For example, in Michigan, it's been found since the 2020 election that the Michigan Secretary of State's guidance on how you determine signature matches was illegal guidance. In Pennsylvania, you had illegal ballot harvesting. So to say that the president speaking into those concerns is an unofficial act when Congress, Democratic congressmen, President Biden himself has addressed election integrity and proposed bills regarding it since 2020, I think is illogical. So I believe the D.C. Circuit Court is rather trapped in this if they read this decision carefully. But it is clear this Supreme Court will not uphold this prosecution if it comes back to them under this set of facts claiming that the president was engaged in unofficial activity. That's fascinating. So this is, uh, what you just described is what makes this a bombshell case against the Jack Smith case of former President Trump. If I can, our time's slipping away, I'd like to get to another topic, but it, it keeps running down this same general path. Uh, the Democrats are now obviously considering their political options after the disastrous debate that Joe Biden had uh, with President Trump. A question that keeps coming up over and over and over, can they, the Democrats, can they legally replace President uh, Joe Biden on the ballot at this point, at this stage in the game? Yes, they can. And let, let me come back to that in just a moment, adding one more thing about this immunity, Congressman. The Supreme Court really sent a message directly to Jack Smith, because in rejecting his approach under the law, in this case, it quoted the last time he was before the U.S. Supreme Court in a prosecution of a former Virginia governor in, in which he lost 9-0. And the court basically said, you are undermining democracy in your approach and contorting the laws to forge your prosecution. Wow. And it quoted from that case. So it was wow. a direct message. Um, the D Democratic Party rules allow for their delegates to to vote based on their conscience at the Democratic Convention. That rule was changed in 1982 to allow them to do so. So they're, they're not strictly beholden to President Biden and his nomination. They can change it. Most likely, if Mr. Biden is to be replaced, it would involve a withdrawal of his candidacy, which would free those delegates naturally, and they could select somebody to replace them. Um, if he withdraws after the convention and after he receives the nomination, the Democratic rules allow the Democratic 
party, the DNC, in consultation with Democratic governors in Congress to replace them on the nomination uh, as the Democratic nominee. So they are capable of doing it. The rules allow it to happen. It's um, it's a difficult process because the Democratic Party has some factionalism built into their super delegate. Uh, uh, numbers at their convention. So these interest groups have specific and higher authority to impact who might replace Biden on the ticket. And of course, they have the natural presumptive nominee in the vice president um, in Ms. Harris that many of the Democrat delegates do not want to support as an alternative. So it's messy, but it can be yes. done legally. OK, so so what about I mean, the whole process of any election and the, the primary part of it, I mean, particularly for president of the United States, they're running for office for a couple of years involved in the campaign. And that's all about the, the voters being able to vet the candidates, to get to know the candidates, to know what they believe, this and the other. States have primary elections, so the nominee is in that role based upon the votes of the party the selecting them. So uh, could some disgruntled Democrats who voted for Biden during the primaries, could they potentially sue a new Democratic candidate for president if, uh, if someone else were nominated? Well, unfortunately, in America today, almost anybody can sue. And you can also find a court to accept yeah. the lawsuit. But but the party rules are pretty pretty are, are pretty clear, and this has also been the history of our presidential nominating conventions, and that is those party rules determine and and states in in the past almost all states have allowed the parties to determine the method to select their nominees. Now interestingly, the Democrats have been fighting to change state law so that that party rule is not available to them. For example, here in Virginia, the Democrats have successfully changed the law to not allow closed primaries or the Republican primary to prevent others from participating. Um, so there is some effort to change this. But right now in America, generally, the party gets to select its nominee. And these delegates are selected based on a pledge to support Mr. Biden. So voters voted for those delegates, much, much like presidential electors. And they voted for these delegates. These delegates pledged to vote for Biden. And party rules now say they can vote their conscience so that even though they made the pledge to Biden, if their conscience somehow dictates they should vote otherwise, they can, even without a formal release. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a, a huge mess, and I'm sorry we've got less than a minute uh, left here, but I, there are some states that uh, already have Biden on the ballot. They, they, they can't change that, from my understanding. Uh, you've got the 25th Amendment coming up. You've got the possibility of uh, the president stepping down before this, uh, is it going to get messier before it ever gets cleaned up? Well, it's already messy. And then you yes. also have, Congressman, you, you have the money. Um, I think right. President Biden is sitting on 30 or $50 million, and those funds can't be transferred to any other candidate but the vice president. And otherwise, they go to a super PAC or a charity, a nonprofit, and they're are many, unfortunately, leftist partisan nonprofits that could accept these monies and impact the election. So um, it is already messy, and it's Probably going to be get messy. Yep. Thank you, Phil Klein, Associate Professor at Law of Law at Liberty University. Always great to have you on the program. Thank you. All right, friends, that wraps up this edition of Washington Watch. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got more coming your way the rest of the week, so we'll see you tomorrow. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com.